Hey everyone, this is Keith Scott from out in Sydney, Australia. I'm one of the voices of Bullwinkle J. Moose. It's time to watch Relentless and Unstoppable. And so give it up for your main hosts, Douglas Kenny and Andy McPhee. Hey everybody, this is Doug Kenny and welcome to Relentless and Unstoppable. We have another amazing guest coming on the channel today, so please hit like and subscribe. And after this episode, please stay tuned to the RNU channel for more amazing guests. Let's get this on! Hey everybody, how you doing? Just a, a quick uh, little share of why I started Relentless and Unstoppable. It was for one very simple reason, because of Doug Kenny. Nothing to do with me at all, zero. I was just coaching Doug and he took on the coaching and mentoring and he made all the changes. He took all the suggestions from his his parents as well as my, my coaching. But it was all about Doug, his breakthrough and his weight loss, uh, he, his willingness to accept that uh, he is dealing with high functioning autism and, and other issues, but he's never quit, he's never given up. So we did one interview with him to share his story and then we decided to start interviewing other people. And Doug has now taken over the whole channel and he does all the interviews. He runs everything. He's just an amazing young man. So RNU was born from simply what an amazing young man Doug is and his story needed to be shared. Yeah, it was it was it was a it was a busy 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 day, and uh, and the next gosh, it just we didn't we of course we had no office to go back to, so I, I visited briefly with with uh, the family, and then she and I went home, and it's dark now, and we had turned all the lights on and then stood up. I stayed up till about two o'clock in the morning, just talking. I couldn't stop talking about this thing. Then we decided we better try to get some sleep. Turned all the lights off. Ten minutes later, she turned to me and said, would you like to talk about this? And I said, yes. <laughs> we got up, turned all the lights off, and I kept on talking. And then uh, the telephone service was out because it overloaded all the systems. And the, one of the Verizon centers was uh, right next door to uh, Building Seven and across the street from Building Five, mm. which were all totally, totally damaged. <clears throat> but the internet was working, so we began exchanging emails with colleagues, and we began making lists of who we knew made it out and who was yet unaccounted for. And then four days later, uh, one of the senior fellows called me and asked if I would be willing to. To uh, assist in the, in the, the temporary command center that they set up out in Jersey City, <laughs> so I did that for many, many weeks, and uh, it was it was quite a time, quite a busy time, figuring out where everybody was, trying to pull, figure out where we we're going to put thousands of people to put them back to work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we we eventually made it. Glad you made it. So, what made you decide to write a book? Well, that's an interesting question. It was the second night, December 12th. My wife and I were sitting up again, late into the night, talking about this thing. And the thought entered my head, just like the walk ace thought. Now, three words, write a book. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, was, that was out of the blue. I had no idea. I'm not an author. I don't write. Just the normal, the normal emails and and memos, that sort of thing, that, that are required in business. <laughs> so I thought about it for a while, and after about, after about, uh, oh, how much time passed? I don't know, six months? I uh, talked to so many people and knew what their experiences were. I, I, I wrote out a list of a dozen and a half questions, <clears throat> purchased a tape recorder, asked them if they would be willing to be uh, characters in, in a book I'd like to write about, however, one escaped, and just started interviewing people. My sister, very kindly, one of my, my sisters, asked if, if she could transcribe the tapes to uh, the text. 
she did a very nice job with that. It was very helpful. And then it was just a matter of ask, asking additional questions and filling in the gaps and putting, weaving it together. And uh, eventually, eventually it happened. Was, the whole, that whole situation is, is very interesting and in how it, it came to be. My wife was ill <laughs> at the time. I was three quarters of the way through the manuscript, the draft manuscript. And uh, it, her illness took, took me full time to, so I just shelved it. And post 9-11, I developed and invented a, a security program for the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey and all the transportation agencies in, in the tri-state region. And uh, one day we were walking through the uh, Port Authority, the hole in the ground, where they were still cleaning and uh, cleaning up the mess. And the project manager, a lady, turned to me and said, Eric, by the way, how's your book coming? I said, oh, Terry, I've shelved the book. I said, who, who could, too much time has passed. Who could possibly be interested in a book about 9-11? Well, she, in astonishment, she stopped in her tracks and with both arms did a 360-degree sweep of the 16 acres of the World Trade Center. We put up a, a, a big security fence so that people couldn't just walk in. And every single day, Doug, thousands and thousands and thousands of tourists would find their way to lower Manhattan and hang on that fence and just look in. And she's sweeping her arms, showing me these thousands of people. And, there, and literally, there were thousands of people. And I said, oh, I guess you're right. <laughs> they are interested. They are interested in 9-11. In, in, uh, and uh, so that reignited my interest. And then I coincidentally reunited with an old classmate of mine from 35 years ago that I hadn't seen since graduation and discovered that he was a, an executive of Barnes and Nobles. Their headquarters was two blocks from our temporary headquarters in, in Manhattan. Mm. So, I went over, so I went over, went up to his floor, asked the secretary to uh, ask him to come out and we reunited and we went to lunch and we went to lunch once once a month for a number of months and then he began asking me questions yeah and, and 12 years later it's still selling that's amazing and it really is the hardcover a new a new ebook is coming out uh, today it's the fifth it's released today on Amazon soft cover will be coming out soon a new soft cover and and the audiobook, it's, the audiobook has been selling all along. It's just remarkable, the uh, interest in this little book that I wrote. Yeah, what's the message you hope to give through the book? Well, I didn't write it with a message in, in mind, um, but when I, I'm on the, the, the public speaking tour from time to time, <laughs> and I do like to get across the fact that we have, it's an imperative in in, in disaster situations, how imperative it is to keep calm and don't panic. If we keep calm and think clearly, we know what the right thing to do is, and uh, we can learn from adversity. And one of the lessons I try to get across is, <clears throat> is live each day as if it were your last. Because if we knew today was, was the last day I was going to be alive on Earth, I would treat my family, my, my, my parents, my wife and husband, my friends, my colleagues, I would treat them a lot differently than I do normally. Um, and uh, we, we, so if we did that every single day, we'd be, we'd be better, better people for it. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's great. What are you hoping to achieve this year? Gee, that's all we have for Relentless and Unstoppable. So tune in to the next episode 
to hear more amazing stories from amazing guests. This is Keith Scott from Sydney, Australia, saying so long and uh, I'm smarter than the average bear. Gee.